Mode. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Xamarin University. We are excited this morning to have David Platt with us. Uh, if you're not familiar with David, he's he's a uh, he's a teacher and uh, he teaches programming at Harvard University Extension School, specifically .NET programming, I believe, and as well as teaching at companies all over the world. He's also the author of several great books, including one of my favorites, Why Software Sucks. If you've never read that, you should go out and make sure to buy that. He's a software legend from Microsoft and just an all-around great guy that just knows lots about a lot of things. And we're excited uh, this morning to have him here talking about user interface design, specifically user experience design, I should clarify that. And uh, so good morning, David. Good morning, Mark. Thank you so much. And uh, good morning, everybody. I'm glad you could all be here virtually. My name is Dave Platt. And as uh, Mark just got finished telling you, I am the head honcho of um, Rolling Thunder Computing. I am the only honcho of Rolling Thunder Computing. You might have known me for my uh, .NET book. That's the first one on Microsoft.NET. Um, and I teach at uh, Harvard University in the Extension School, as he said. I teach .NET there. I'm also teaching user experience engineering there. Um, and that's that's kind of my new passion here in the computing business. Um, you might see my monthly column in MSDN Magazine. I am the back page columnist. The column is entitled Don't Get Me Started. Um, the April Fool's Day edition is the keystone of my editorial year. Don't forget to check back on those. And um, yes, this book was fun to write. Why Software Sucks? It was easy to write. All I had to do was open my veins and bleed. And um, and anybody who wants to find it, it, it will be in the usual places. I like the Italian edition the best. That guy looks mucho pissed off, you know. That's it, which is what users get when computers don't do what the users wish they would. And um, and this is my forthcoming book. I'm writing a new one called The Joy of UX. If you think you see a parallel with the joy of cooking and the joy of sex, you are absolutely correct. And my goal is to make this belong on every desktop the same way that the joy of sex, uh, the joy of cooking belongs in every kitchen and the joy of sex in every bedroom. Could have gone the other way with that, but maybe I won't. Anyhow, and it'll be out this December in uh, from Addison Wesley. Looking for, I'm writing it now. It's 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 fun. It's it's um it's it's more work than the other one was, but it's it's going to be great when I get it out. Anyway, so today I am going to be showing you a case study. Uh, you guys are all doing Xamarin. You all want to write mobile apps, and I am going to show you a case study of how you need to think about your users when you build a mobile app. And it's not in the, the magic gizmo is not in the toolkit, any toolkit. The magic gizmo is between your ears, my friends. And let me show you the kind of thinking that you need to do and the kind of ways that you need to do that. So anyway, I'm going to talk about the MBTA, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. Um, it's here in the Boston area. That's their website. You see they have a lot of stuff. They have rail, they have bus, they have subway, they have boat. I'm going to talk about the rail, one that you see there highlighted right, uh, right here. And uh, that is commuter rail. If you go look at it, the um, local commuter rail here in the Boston area, it is the third busiest in the nation. It's behind New York and Chicago. It is tied with Philadelphia for third. It's got about 10 lines going on 400 miles of track, 127 stations, 130,000 riders every day. And most of them right now are royally pissed off. Right? We had record snowfall last year. It knocked the living daylights out of the schedules. It's, it's absolutely terrible. Because you know what? They haven't come back. They have still not recovered from it. Cars are broken. They didn't have time to turn up the air conditioning. The tracks are buckling now because they're too hot instead of because they're too cold. Um, it, it, there's just been a, uh, a huge firestorm of criticism about the commuter rail in the last six months or so. And so I have to ask, hey, you know what? Can we make users here happy, uh, happier than they are with a mobile app? Okay, good question. And I think we actually can. And I'm going to show you the kind of thought processes that we would go through in order to do this. And, um, and I hope you find this illuminating. So this is Platt's first, last, and only law of user experience design. And that is, know thy user, for he is not thee. Your user is not you. Your user is not you. Your user is not you, OK? Your user is not you. Stop me if I get too technical here. Unless you're writing programs for a bunch of burned out computer geeks, your user is not you. And whenever I see an app that sucks, I mean, that really sucks, The and I go and investigate how it got into that sucky state, the answer invariably is that the person who built it, designed it, constructed it, whatever, did not understand who their user actually was, and therefore mistakenly thought um, that their users were like themselves, wanted the same things, feared the same things, valued the same things, and of course, uh, they are not. 
So we'll, we'll come back to that uh, idea as we go. All right, so what do you not do? What do you not do when you build an app? Well, what you do not do, I, I know you want to just grab Xamarin Studio and fire it up and start dragging and dropping and put things on a design surface and say, oh, look, a radio button here, ah, you know, a checkbox, drop down list, I know, that's it. Ah, we'll swipe left and we'll swipe right. Won't that be cool? Wrong. Wrong, my friends. That kind of stuff comes last, not comes first. What comes first? I will show you what comes first. The first thing to understand is that we are not doing graphical design. Whenever I talk about user experience design, everybody says, oh yeah, colors, right? Fonts, right? No. That's why I use the term user experience rather than user interface. And they, 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 they think that this, this artsy fartsy stuff is what we're doing. And as I will show you with examples very soon, no, this is not what we're doing. And they want to delay the interaction design that I'm going to talk about. Ah, oh, well, let's get the internals working first, and then we will uh, we'll throw it over the fence to people that uh, to round off the corners and make it look pretty. No, exactly wrong. The interaction design is the most internal of all the internals that we're doing. And as you will see, we'll determine, greatly determine, the code that gets written. You can't wait until this thing is built and then go figure out what would make the user happy because uh, the decisions of what the user will, uh, what will actually make the user happy dictates drastically the amount of the type of code that you're going to need to write. So this is not what we're doing. I'll show you in a bit. Also, you need to work with actual users, with real, genuine, actual users. Whenever you're talking to people, I, I can't stand it when I go to a company and say, let me talk to some users, and say, well, I, I, I can't. The users won't talk to you. They, 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 they already know what they, you know, I know what they want. I'm their manager. I know what the users want. Um, once in a very long while, you have a manager came up from the ranks, and it's actually true. More often than not, they, they just don't want you uh, bothering their people. Well, you know, if the app doesn't work, that's really going to bother their people, and um, you really need to work with actual users. And um, that's the second thing that we're going to see as we go through this. I'll show you the kinds of things that I had to do to get with actual users. All right. So, anyway, the first step, I'm going to be using this thing I call it the Platsky Protocol, named after myself. That's my... That's my gnome de guerre. And it's a series of steps. And you're going to see these steps laid out in the Joy of UX. And step one, who? Who? Well, you know this here, don't you? Yeah. I mean, the fellow's name on first base. Who? The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yeah. One of my all-time favorites. Okay, so who? Who? Who is our user? Who is our user? Good question. Okay, so, um, hey, I'm going to be writing an MBA commuter rail, MBTA commuter rail application. Who rides the MBTA commuter rail, and how do we find out? Do I have to stand out there with a clipboard counting so many men, so many women? Uh, how old is that guy, etc.? No, well, the answer is it's actually fairly easy. I um, did a quick Google search. Um, the... T trains have advertising on them. I searched for their advertising agency. I found this one and on their website. I sent them an email saying, hey, send me your media kit, please. And here, this is what they sent me. This is who rides commuter rail in Boston. And if you look there, um, you can see it's uh, just about evenly split male and female, 52% male, just about um, uh, even Stephen. The, um, if you look at the age breakdown, I'll come back to that in a second, the household income is not bad. Um, what is it? What do we have here? Well, the answer is the genders and even split. The age skews a little bit older. It's a little bit hard to see from that bar graph, but 51% um, of the commuter rail riders are 45 years old or greater. And 72% are age 35 or greater. Um, we're not doing kids. We're not doing college students. We're really not even doing millennials yet. And I suspect the reason why is that, um, hey, when, when young people get married, they stay in the city for a while. They stay in the city. They stay in the city. They have their first kid in the city. And they don't move out into the suburbs and need to take the commuter rail until they get the second kid and the golden retriever and the swing set and all that. So, so I think that's why commuter rail users skew older. Um, so, so even split male and female, but they're older than uh, the average bear. Okay, what do we do? Um, also, I wanted to know, because um, I wanted to tie this into a fare purchase system, uh, how do riders pay their fares? And if I do a quick Google, I find out that about 57% of uh, the commuter rail fares are paid with monthly passes, and 43% are paid with occasional tickets. Okay, fine, that's what I need to know. Smidge over half um, by monthly um, smidge over half of the fares are paid by, mo by monthly passes. Fine, good. 
All right. So what I decided to do for my user population is to split the user population into monthly pass buyers and non-monthly pass buyers because, again, a little bit over half of the rides are done on monthly passes and a little bit under half are done on individual tickets. All right, so that's how I decided to split the user population and um, you can think about the different kinds of users that I have. Now, here's the key point. Know thy user for he is not thee. Um, in order to talk about users, you have to talk about specific people. You can't just say, ah, my user does this or my user does that. You know, you can't, uh, you can't do that. Your brain does not glom on to the abstraction of the user. Right? Instead, you know, come on, we evolved in small groups uh, where almost everybody was related to everybody else. You were programmed to care about individual people, not about large groups. Um, what was it that Stalin gets credited for? The death of an individual is a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic. Exactly. So if we are going to think about our users, our brains can only grasp specific people. Um, if we say, hey, is the user going to like this? Uh, that's one kind of thing. If we say, is Charlie going to like that? Can't you just feel different parts of your brain lighting up when I ask the question about the specific person with a name versus if I ask the question of the abstract group, you know, our users? Indeed. So, um, so I came up with two different uh, people. Um, a persona is an artificial person who embodies the characteristics of our, uh, of our user group. And you don't say, hey, is our user going to like this? You're going to say, hey, is Claire going to like this? If you say, hey, is this too hard for our user to use? You're going to say, hey, is Charlie going to have trouble with this? Or is Charlie going to stay to hell with it and go somewhere else instead? Okay, entirely different questions. You think about them in an entirely different fashion. And this is the kind of thing that you need to do. First, you know, there is no tool for this on Xamarin or any other developer's toolkit that I know. This is the kind of thought process that you need to go through before you start approaching your developer's tools. Who are our users and how do we represent them in a way that our minds can grok? Okay, so I came up with these two people and you need to start with a picture like there. There's Claire on the left, there's Charlie on the right. They're easy to find on the web. And this is a worksheet that I made up and uh, I put a picture there. Her name is Claire, the cranky everyday commuter. She lives in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, there's her tagline. I call it, I need commuter rail to get to, uh, to my job every day. Uh, it's really critical for me. Uh, we've got information about how she uses our, um, our commuter rail here. There's the route that she takes. How often does she do it every weekday? What's her usual train and so on? How does she pay her fare? Uh, personal information, she's 42, she has a community college degree, she's a respiratory therapy aide, etc. Divorced, uh, I got some kids, that's the car. Um, I put in some additional information just to flesh it out, just to help your brain understand, to, to, to grab onto her, a receptor site, if you will. Uh, there's the car she drives, there's the drink she likes to drink, there are her hobbies, she doesn't have time for any hobbies. Um, there's her pet peeve, you know, she can't stand it when the trains get canceled and she doesn't know about it and she gets to the station and she's standing there in the snow and there's no train and, and, and she gets really angry. Um, so so that, that is the persona, that represents the users and doing this research, figuring out who the person is, fleshing it out, putting it here in a way that your developers can understand, this is one of the, this is the first thing that you really need to do. It is also fairly common as you start doing this that you find that there is information that you need that you don't have. Um, the MBTA had the ages and the genders and the household incomes and such of their uh, of their riders. It is fairly common that you go and you look at this and you, you start looking for a piece of information and you realize, oh, damn, we don't have this, do we? And so you find out very early in the development process that, hey, we really have to go um, go find out what the case is here, what is the age distribution of our users, et cetera, uh, before you can start uh, doing intelligent design for them. Okay, so those are our personas, and that is step one of the Platsky protocol that we've got to do here. Now, obviously, uh, I have to go through these things very, very quickly here so we can get through everything in an hour. Um, when I come and teach at your company and help you work through these things and, and so on, we spend a lot more time on this. Uh, but this is, this is we, we've just got to skim it because we have to cover all of the bases today. Okay, so, all right, so that was who. Who are we doing this? And now the question is what? Platsky Protocol Step 2, what? And when and where and why, but mostly what? Right? What, by which I mean what here? Okay, what problems are our users trying to solve? These users, Claire and Charlie, what problems are they trying to solve? And what would they consider to be the characteristics of a good solution? 
notice that I haven't touched a development tool yet. Uh, again, this is the, the kinds of things that I need to know before I can start using the development tools intelligently. Okay. So, um, okay, what problems are they trying to solve and how do we represent them? I will show you in just a bit. Right? And it's really not as hard as you think once you put aside your preconceived notions, once you, once you understand that, no, you don't really know this. Okay? You think you do, but you don't. You have to ask your users, just like a doctor has to ask the patient, where does it hurt? The doctor doesn't say, hmm, where do I think that patient hurts? No, he says to the patient, yo, hey, man, what? Tell, tell me where it hurts, would you? I, I, I don't see why this is such a revelation in the computing business, but it seems to be. Anyway, don't get me started. All right. Um, it's fairly easy. You follow the money. You look for the pain. How do we get this information? And it's not so hard. You can try asking them. That's kind of what I did in this case. And it didn't take long either because they all said the same thing very loudly, very clearly. Um, I went to my commuter rail station. And I stood there. I went in the morning while, uh, while the guys were waiting uh, for the train to come in. Uh, they're, they're not there for that long, only about 10 minutes or so. Um, but I, I could talk to them more in the morning than I can in the evening when they're just running to their cars and want to get home to their first drink and things like that. I asked them how often they ride the commuter rail. What do you like most about riding it? And what's your biggest problem riding it? Oh, by the way, how do you pay your fare and what kind of smartphone do you have? So I just asked a bunch of people this. Yo, hey, what about this? And after I got 10 or 12 or so, um, some patterns started to reveal themselves. It was um, fairly easy. In, in retrospect, it will seem painfully obvious. Uh, you often find that in, in this business. You, you, when you do your research and you find out things, you say, well, oh, geez, of course. Well, yes, of course. But you didn't know that until you did the research. And, and now, you know, yes. Anyway, what problems are they trying to solve? Well, the schedules, the changing schedules, the 7.30 train is delayed until 8.10. That's the biggest problem that they have. And the 8 o'clock train is canceled and won't be replaced, and the next one after that is at 9.45. That's their biggest problem. Do I, do I have to get up and take the 6 o'clock train to go in? Do I have to get up at 4 in the morning to drive in and beat the traffic? Um, should I try to work from home if I can? Or you know, should I just, just fake a case of smallpox and, 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 and um, call in sick that day? Right. So anyway, schedules, 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 schedules are what we need. So I know when to come to the goddamn station is what the user said to me. All right. In paraphrasing here a little bit. And uh, I said, what about alerts? Do you want uh, to, to know if a train's a cancel? And they, they, after the first two or three guys said to me, well, gosh, you know, that's the same thing as scheduled, isn't it? I realized that, yeah, it actually is. So schedules and alerts are more or less the same thing. And also, um, a number of people asked me, you know what? I want to be able to buy my ticket on my phone and, and have my pass appear on my phone. So there's one less piece of paper I got to search around for. OK, fine. I understand that. But schedules are the biggest problem. That's, that's what most people told me. OK. so. All right, and I, I asked some people, you know, what would you consider a, a good solution? I, I was sort of expecting them to say, well, I want to be able to swipe left or swipe right, but but I, I knew better than that. They all said, yeah, I'll tell you what, it's, it's it's I can tell you in one word, it's easy. It's easy to use, easy to use, easy to use. I don't want doodads. I don't want uh, dancing paper clips. Um, you know, I, I want this thing to be easy. I'm not commuting for fun, okay? I just want to get it done. I want this, I won't repeat their language, um, thing to go away, okay? I... I, you know, easy, easy, easy to set up, easy, easy, easy to be used. And I said, do you care? What about security? And they said, yeah, 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 yeah I, I suppose. It wasn't a big thing to them. So, you know, secure enough, I suppose. But easy, 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 easy is what they all said. Okay. And, and again, one, one, this, this ought to be painfully obvious, shouldn't it? Um, but we'll come back to that. All right. So, um, okay, I've got that, and now what I need to do is I need to write this down in a way that our developers and designers will understand, to write down the user's needs. Now, there's kind of two different ways I could do it. I could make it prescriptive. I can write it like this that you see here. The system shall display schedules to the user on demand. Well, you know, it's not like I got a two-by-four up my ass. You know, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, the system shall allow the user to see arrival time, departure time, and train number. Again, highly stilted language. Um, it's it's uh, written from the system point of view rather than the user point of view. Um, it's really not giving you any feeling at all for the person using it. It's um, None of it is couched in terms of the personas we just spent all this time generating. Um, this is the way that, to the extent that it ever does get done, this is the way, and this is the wrong way. So, all right, Platt, you wise ass, uh, what is the right way? Let me show you. The answer is with stories. 
that's the main way that the human animal has communicated, isn't it? Uh, since since forever, um, they, um, the, the expert in law asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And did Jesus give a, 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 a link? Of, 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 of the second cousin twice removed? No, what did he do? He told a story, didn't he? He told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Stories are how human beings communicate. So that's how we're going to communicate the, the uh, needs of um, our users here. We're going to make stories. So here's one. Um, Claire wakes up in the morning, turns on a coffee maker. There have been a couple inches of new snow overnight. She checks to see if the train schedule has gotten even more screwed up. Damn! They canceled it. It has. They canceled a regular train. There's an earlier one actually an even earlier one that got delayed, that she can still grab as she hustles. She yells to her daughter that she'll have to get the others out to the school bus, throws on her clothes, runs out the door, cursing the politicians who screwed up the transport network. Uh, but she makes a train. She keeps her job. She doesn't even get her pay docked. She, she does have to pick up the load for employees who couldn't get in until noon because their trains got screwed up and they didn't have our cool app, but, you know, that's their problem. Fortunately, many of their patients got stranded too, so the workload isn't quite as bad as it might have been. Uh, the outbound trains are all messed up too, but at least she can see which ones are actually running so she can tell her kids when she'll be home. She'll order pizza delivery for dinner tonight. See? Now, don't you have a feel for her? Don't you Don't you understand? You pick up your phone and say, damn, wonder, wonder, where's, where's the schedule? Now you can feel it. Could you feel this? You could not feel this. But hey, you can feel this one here. Okay. All right, here's another one. Uh, Charlie. Charlie's at work in downtown Boston. The client invites him to stay in town for dinner. He needs to know the last few trains of the evening so he knows when he has to leave in order to make the last train home. He pulls out his iPhone. He taps our app. The app sees that it's late afternoon and the current location is in the city, so it automatically comes up with today's schedule showing with the outbound trains highlighted. It knows from the ticket he purchased this morning where he's traveling to, so it shows the times for that line. There's one leaving our station at uh, 1940. Uh, it's probably a little bit too early. The next one's at 2120. So, okay, Charlie if uh, Charlie can hang around for a while with his client. He can have coffee. He can have dessert. He can talk a little business. Uh, the last one's at 2345. So if he misses that one at 2120, he'll have to sit in the train station for two and a half hours, which is no fun at all. And if he misses that one, he'll have to take a $100 cab ride to a suburban home or sleep on the station benches, which is even less fun, if you can imagine that. So now you see how the user is going to use our app, how Charlie is going to use our app. You see how it fits in. Charlie does not want to use our app. Charlie wants to have used our app. Okay? Charlie does, is not interested in our app in and of itself. He is only interested in knowing when the darn train is so he knows how long he can stay and then schmooze with the client. That's how we make this real to our developers is we have these artificial people and then we write these stories that, de that describe how these artificial people are going to use our application, right? That's what we're doing here. Stories are what make it real. Okay. So, all right. So now the Platsky Protocol, step three, how? How do we start doing this? How should, how can we approach these problems that the users are trying to solve? Okay. Well, let's talk about it. Uh, we can look at the, you usually start by examining the existing state of the art and uh, for ideas, good or bad, see, see how close anybody has ever come to it. Uh, that's what you do when you write a book, for example. You look at what other people have written about that same topic and then make sure you're writing one that hasn't been handled or has been handled poorly or there's something, which is what I'm doing and so on. There actually is a commuter rail app for the MBTA and it absolutely sucks. All right, this is it. Um, this is the first, uh, this is the home screen, and the first thing wrong with the home screen is you can't do anything from the home screen, nothing at all, right? You can't buy a ticket, you can't look at a schedule, you, you, you can't do a damn thing. All you can do is go other places, right? This was designed by a graphical designer who did not understand that their users are not like her. She said, oh, look, I'll make it look pretty. Hey, there's a picture of a ticket. Doesn't that look nice? Doesn't that suggest a ticket? Ah, we'll put the buttons in the middle. Yes, we'll balance the space. Isn't that fabulous? Oh, this is our brand name. Aren't I cool? Hey, pay me a lot of money. Um, you know, because she thought it was cool. She didn't think who her users were. Does a railroad commuter want to admire the beauty of that ticket? They do not want to admire the beauty of that ticket. They don't even want to have admired the beauty of that ticket. They want to get on the damn train. All right? And they don't want to fiddle around with this um, anytime. So, um, all right, so, so that's the home page, and it stinks. Let's go look at the rest of it. Uh, you can buy a ticket from here, and it's actually not too bad. Um, there on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see you type in the station that you're going to. Um, they did two things things here that are good. First of all, they auto-fill that space as you type in IP. They, they put in the stations. Um, they have a drop-down list based on the number of um, uh, 
you know, they, they auto suggest as you type it in, and that's good. They also keep your recent trips because commuter rail is a very repetitive kind of thing. So there you see North Station to Ipswich. It's actually not bad. Uh, when you select the ones that you want, there on the right hand side, that's what it costs. Okay, that's not too bad. Uh, there you type in your credit card, it remembers your credit card, that's good. Um, it says, okay, do you want to buy this? Yes, pay now. All right, you know, not, not too bad. Um, the one thing wrong here is you have to type in your CVV number every time, and um, that's that's a pain in the ass. You got to take out your wallet and your credit card in the crowded station. Don't really want to do that. Um, it, it should be just a one tap, but I haven't quite got to that. Um, anyway, so there you buy the ticket. There you activate it. Uh, it, it. It could it beats standing in line. This is this is you could be once you get to it, um, and it's a little more trouble getting to it than it should be. Um, once you start doing it, it's not too bad. It's better than the alternative. This one's sort of kind of okay. But what else do you need? They, uh, when I talk to the users, this is their tertiary uh, requirement. 57% of the users um, have monthly passes with auto renew. They never need to buy it. So this is only for the occasional riders. And, and it's good. This, this, this is helpful. Uh, but it's not the main thing because everybody cares about schedules, and they especially care about the schedules when they've been changing, and for the last six months they've been changing a lot. All right, and, and probably will for the foreseeable future at the rate they're going. All right, so what do we need to do here? So the ticket purchase is pretty good. Let's look at the other pieces. The schedules are absolutely awful. Okay, the schedules would need to um, improve by two or three levels to rise to the level of sucking. Um, there we are, there, that's the home screen, and uh, you have to tap schedules. When you tap schedule, they bring you here, you have to tap schedules again. Oh, did you really want schedules? Um, yeah, I really want schedules. You have to then tap the line that you want. There are 10 different commuter rail lines, pick the one that you want. And then you get this um, very confusing display. Somebody tell me, where's the next train going in from Ipswich? And the answer is, it's very hard to find. Okay, that's absolutely terrible. Um, what they did, and, and alerts, alerts are the same thing. Um, alerts are even worse. Uh, you look at the home page, it doesn't have anything for alerts. There's no place to show you alerts. Alerts, by definition, are the things that are time critical, aren't they? That's what an alert means, isn't it? Um, alerts like, oh my god, uh, everybody, somebody's shooting somewhere. Here, shelter in place, please. Um, or, hey, your train's been canceled, tough luck, sorry. Um, so I, but, but to do that, you, you don't even see alerts on the home screen. You don't even know alerts exist until you tap schedules. Then you go to then you go to this next screen. You have to tap alerts again. Then you have to pick your line, and it shows you which one. Here on the lower line, for example, there is one upcoming and one ongoing alert. What the hell is the difference between an upcoming and an ongoing alert? I don't really know. But the green check mark seems to indicate that things are going okay, but it's got a couple of alerts. What the hell? Um, and you tap that, and there are the alert details. Um, you know, it's four levels deep. I mean, that's not where alerts ought to be. Um, Lowell trains 216 to 220 will be temporarily removed on uh, Monday, May 4th. Uh, you know, what, what, what the hey? Um, it's hard to read. So the schedules are terrible, and the alerts are even worse. The, the, the ticket purchase is not too bad. You know, I've, I've seen worse. Um, I haven't seen worse than these. So, all right. So that's, that's what we have. The schedules are awful. The alerts are even worse. So. Um, what are we going to do? Let's start thinking about it. Let's put ourselves in, this, in the um, shoes of these users. If you think about it, what do they have here? Uh, go, go back here. It is up to the user to do all this work. I want to see a schedule. I want to see the schedule on this line. I was in the inbound, outbound, weekday, weekend, whatever. Um, the user has to do all of this work. And even then, even when you're looking at uh, the schedule of a particular train, it shows you all the different stations, but the user almost always is going to and from the same station. So he's got to pick this out uh, every single time. Uh, what they've done here is they've really just taken the printed timetable and made you do taps to navigate through the printed timetable. And that is something we can improve upon greatly. Greatly, greatly. They, it didn't seem to occur to them that they should have done that. It, I, I think they just built the ticket purchase app and said, all right, what else can we have? Well, here's our timetable. Here, throw it in there. Maybe somebody will want it, but not the way it is now. Anyhow, point is we can do uh, a whole lot better, and here's how. The commuter rail is a highly repetitive operation. Almost everybody takes the train from the suburbs into the city in the morning and from the city out to the suburbs in the evening. They almost always ride from the same station um, both ways and um, to and from the same station. Once in a while it changes. This guy will stay over at his girlfriend's house and take a, a train in from a different station the next morning. It happens, but not that often. 
and um, we should use our knowledge of the repetitive nature here to help our individual users to do work so that the individual user doesn't have to. And we can get a lot of information from um, location. Think about it. That's, that's what mobile. That's one of the biggest uh, force multipliers you have on a mobile app is that the user is walking around, and you can tell where the user is. And um, and with our cell level location, we can, which doesn't take any more power, we can get close enough for commuter rail purposes. What the hell are you talking about, Platzi? Okay. So this is what we are going to do. We are going to try to use our location, of our knowledge of commuter behavior, of user behavior, and of our time and location in order to make this user's job a whole lot easier. Okay. All right. So what do we do now? Well, now we're going to make some mock-ups. Okay, some sketches. Now, a sketch, think about what a sketch means. A sketch, you know, you think about taking pencil and paper and, um, and making a pencil sketch. Okay, um, what is a sketch about? A sketch is about doing things very, very quickly and easily. Temporarily, it's not, it's not meant to be the final. It's meant to be a preliminary thing, to suggest, to infer, to stimulate, to stir the pot, if you will. And um, I like doing this on a tool called Balsamic with a Q. And Balsamic is a drag and drop editor like this. It is very, very, very easy to learn and easy to use. It is limited in how fancy it can get. And to me, that limitation is a good thing. Because the whole point here is to make a number of different preliminary sketches. You can see down the side, I've got a number of different layouts that I can then show them to users to do this very, very quickly. I started Monday morning, and I was showing these to users by Monday afternoon. And I had to wait uh, Tuesday morning to get a hold of a couple of them. But the point is to iterate very, very, very quickly and cheaply. You do it very quickly in the beginning, and you find out things. It, it just blew my mind completely. Things that, um, as Pocahontas sings in her, I've, I've, my daughters grew up with Pocahontas, uh, the Disney movie, and she sings in her song, when you walk the footsteps of a stranger, you learn things you never knew you never knew. And that's exactly what happens here. Anyway, really, really easy to use. It's cheap. I think it's only 79 bucks. Um, you can steal a copy for half of that. It's, it's, um, and the idea is to iterate quickly, fancy, cheaply before you spend a lot of money going down a rat hole that's the wrong way, before you spend money writing code that has to get thrown away, before you blow your budget, before you blow your time, before attitudes get hardened. You do this quickly, easily, cheaply, and I will show you some examples. Now, why don't we go into Xamarin Studio just yet? And here's why. Because the Balsamic Toolkit is sparser, it has fewer things in it, and therefore the learning curve is shorter. You can get fluent in Balsamic a lot more quickly than you can in Xamarin Studio or Expression Blend or anything like that. It is much faster and much cheaper to iterate, and that's what we need to do here. Second, the sketches that we make. Um, you see here, they are obviously rough. They are meant to be rough. They are meant to suggest to the user that these things are disposable, that the user that you're showing them to is not upsetting anybody when they say, oh, can you move this over here? Um, that sort of thing. They are meant to, they are meant to seem to be and actually seem to be disposable, so, so nothing is said in concrete. Also, because they are not tied into code, there is no temptation to start coding yet. It would be premature to do so. If you do this in like the, uh, the, the Xamarin Storyboard Editor, it is just so tempting to click here and add a little bit of code, but, but it's not time to do that yet. Um, there, by, by using Balsamic, you are forcing there to be, there's an energy gap, if you will, um, between doing the sketches here and getting up to where you can start writing code. And I want that energy gap to exist because I want you to stay here with the sketches until you've done a lot of good work with them. I don't want it to be easier to jump to the coding. I want there to be an obstacle there because I want you to do the sketching. I think it's extremely important. And I will show you the examples, and I think you'll agree with me once you see them. All right. So anyway, so the Platsky, so, those, so that's how. You think about how. You think about we, we, we've seen who, we've seen what, we've seen how. So now I made some sketches, and we're going to try them out. You try them out on users. You try them out on actual users, and it is surprisingly easy to do this, and then um, um, absolutely astonishing what I learned from them. Okay, here. All right. Uh, you're going to iterate. You're going to iterate a lot. Uh, you're going to try. We're going to do these cheap disposable sketch layouts. It is very important that they be seen as disposable so, so users are willing to make changes. And it's also important 
important, I think it's important, that they be monochrome, because if you don't, you're going to distract the user. If you show the user something that's green, they're going to say, oh, damn, you know, it's, it's green, and then they're going to say, hey, I'd rather have blue, and we're not there yet. I want to take the aesthetics out of this discussion. We're talking about interaction. We're talking about workflow. We are not talking about fonts. We're not talking about colors, uh, at least not much, and um, I don't want them distracted by this. So what did I do? Well, I, I dummied up this sketch, for example. This is one of my first ones. Um, and I did this one on Monday. And I went to some users that I knew. I went to some people in my class, uh, some of the students, and I sent email to my entire class saying, hey, who here rides commuter rail? I want actual users, actual guys who actually ride commuter rail. And I got five or six of them writing back. And, uh, and I scheduled um, um, some, some very fast reviews with some of them. And so on Monday, this is, this is what I did on Monday. And I was sort of figuring, okay, well, here, let, I'm uh, back. Uh, I, I showed you these, the uh, existing app. And the problem with the existing app is that the home screen does nothing at all. Well, here, I'm going to show you, I'm going to put everything on the home screen. There needs to be no navigation at all because everything's right here. You never have to go anywhere else, and it's all right here, and that's just what you do. Okay, that, that was my first thought. Uh, what did I do? Well, you might want to see the schedule today. If it's in the morning, you'll want to see today's schedule. If it's in the evening and you're going home, you might want to see today's schedule. But if you're in the evening sitting at home, you want to see tomorrow's schedule, so tap... Um, so tap this uh, radio button for tomorrow. If you want to see what it is on the weekend, tap this other day. Um, here, from Ipswich, say, that's where Charlie lives, um, to your station, um, these are the trains. And I'm not showing the trains to any other place. Because I know who the user is, he either sets this up in the beginning or when he buys a ticket, I know where he buys it from. So I automatically set this up. And here are the trains going from Ipswich, and here are the trains going from North Station. That's where they are. Here are the alerts right here. Um, I've got a little countdown timer. The next train to North Station leaves Ipswich at 11.17. Uh, there's an alert. The lavatory is out of order. Here is your pass. That's the logo. That's a barcode if they ever start reading barcodes, which they don't do. Um, if you want to buy a ticket, you tap there, but that's not what we're doing there. All right, so, so that was my first layout. And the point is not that this was an, an exceptionally brilliant layout. The point is not that I am such a brilliant guy that I get it right the first time. The point that is I know what I don't know. And um, or, or I know that I don't know things that, that I need to know. I don't know what those things are. Otherwise, I would know them. Now, wouldn't I? But the point is that there's a limit to how good anybody is going to make this first guess. And the point is not making this first guess good, but rather showing it to users, finding out what they think, finding out what they like, finding out what they don't like, and incorporating that feedback and doing it again. The hell are you talking about, Platsky? Well, here's what I mean. All right. Um, this is what users said. They say, well, it's okay, but it's kind of cramped. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in a small uh, place. Um, it's hard to find the next train out. There's too much going on around it. So find, finding the next train here, finding the next train there is hard. Uh, this is a countdown timer. They couldn't really see it. Um, there's too much stuff going on around it. They also wanted to know their arrival time. Everyone always said, well, when does it arrive? And I thought they wouldn't care. I thought they knew. I, number one, they know about how long it takes. And number two, it doesn't matter when, how long the, what the schedule says. The train gets in when it gets in anyway. Uh, but they all said, no, no, I want to see the arrival time here. Do I want to tap the train? And, and again, that's exactly what I wasn't trying to do. And none of them recognized. They all said, oh, what, what are these stupid radio buttons here? And I explained them and said, eh, you know, whatever they all. Um, so so uh, anyway, that's, that's, they, they found this somewhat underwhelming. But the point is that I got very specific feedback. They, they, they didn't know about these things. They didn't care. Um, and they said it's hard to find the next train, and they couldn't, and they wanted to see the arrival time, and they, and they wanted to see the next train, and um, they, they, they weren't quite sure what to do. Okay, fine, good, good. I learned things. You know, I did something that I thought made sense, but, um, but it didn't make sense to my users. Okay, uh, so uh, I redid it, and there, on Wednesday, this is what I got. Um, I kept the today and the tomorrow and the other day. I, 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 I still thought it was important. Um, I'm not the only guy that can get stuck on things. Um, so, all right, I took the pass and I moved it to a separate tab. And so that got me more space here. Um, and with that more space, what I did is I put these lines. Uh, there's the train number. That's when it departs, arrives. There's the status inbound from Ipswich to North Station, outbound from North Station to Ipswich. There's the countdown timer. There's the alert. Aha, okay, man, now I got it. Am I brilliant or what? Hot diggity dog. Boy, this is, this is, this is great. Boy, that, that, that's that, that date. I mean, I'm, I'm the smartest guy in the world. Well, yes and no, until I show it to users and they hand me my head. There. Um, okay, these are some of the same guys, some of the different guys, and they said, all right, it's better. 
but I don't care about tonight's trains in the morning. Here on this um, here on this page, you've got the morning train here, you've got the night trains here. When I'm looking at the morning trains, I don't care about the night trains. And when I look at the night trains, I don't care about the morning trains. Um, they said, do I tap on the Your Pass tab to show the ticket? Yes, you do. And this is the brilliant, uh, boy, this, this, the, the one lady said to me, this is the kind of thing that you get when you talk to users that it never would have occurred to me in a thousand years to ask. She said, you know what? This next train timer, I want it more visible so I know if I have to run to make the train. Uh-huh. And that makes perfect sense because you think about it. These commuter trains don't run anywhere near as frequently as subways or buses. If you miss one, it's at least half an hour until the next one comes along. Uh, sometimes a lot more if it's outside of rush hour. So, so you know, knowing if she has to run to make this, that, that I, I never would have known that. All right. So what did they like about this? Well, they liked having the um, uh, having less stuff here. They liked having the pass on another tab. Um, they were okay with the tab for navigation. I was wondering if that might be more of a desktop idiom. I, I uh, you know, looking for a hamburger or a swipe or something like that. No, they were happy with the tab, um, and they were happier. Okay, fine. So back to the drawing board some more. And here, on Friday, I showed them this. Um, there's the inbound, there's a tab for inbound. There, the next train from Ipswich to North Station departs in 11 minutes on track three. Because that's where they are. They're coming to the station, and where's the, and, and, and what, when, and, when and where is the next train? There it is. Aha. Uh -huh. That's the number one thing they want to know. Brilliant. Okay. Alerts are there. You know, if there are any alerts, uh, you don't have to tap four levels deep to see if there are any alerts. Don't get me started on that one. Um, and here, uh, they, they all said they never looked at the train number. The, um, um, the commuter rail uses that, but they never do. They think it's the 535, you know. So, so all right, there, there's that. I took out the radio buttons. They weren't doing anything. Um, there's the schedule for the other days if, if I did that. So, so I showed them this. So they got the inbound on one tab. I've got the outbound on another tab. I've, I've got the pass on a third. Um, if I had a, if I had a whole lot more tabs there, it'd start getting crowded. But it hasn't yet. Um, and what did they say to this? Well, it's much better. They say it's easy to see the inbound trains. I'll get tonight's from the outbound tab. And that countdown timer is great with the track number. One guy asked, could the tabs be on the bottom for one-handed operation on a crowded train? All right, interesting thought. Um, certainly not technically difficult to do. The point is, uh, not that I was brilliant, I thought this up first. Uh, the point is that, um, that I did this iteration quickly and cheaply, and I learned things that I thought I would find out here, and I learned things that I never would have imagined in a thousand years. Uh, that that, that uh, track timer and, and, and needing, needing to run, and it happens a lot. And so this is what I do. This is what you find when you try it out. All right? And um, all right. So, so that's, that's what you do, and you see why I want it done quickly. You see why I want it done cheaply. You see why I don't want any code written yet. Okay, a couple more steps. There's the telemetry step and the security step. I really don't have time to talk about them today. Um, when, when I teach in-house, we spend a lot of time going over these, but today I don't have time in this one-hour lecture. And finally, the last step is step seven, make it just work. How can you make it just work? And um, I'll give you one more story here. Charlie's at home on a Sunday night. He's taking the train into Boston tomorrow to work for a client. He can't remember the schedule because he doesn't take the train often enough. And the schedule might have changed since last time. It often does. Charlie picks up his phone and taps our app. It somehow magically knows that he needs tomorrow's schedule and somehow automatically shows it to him. Aha. Uh -huh. So um, here. This is what? Uh, Charlie taps the app. It comes up. It detects that it's located in the suburbs. So it automatically shows the inbound tab. All right. And then here it's 5 in the afternoon. There aren't many trains left today, the, uh, seven, the, the 1757 and the 2112. Those are the last two trains that go in you know, on a Sunday. Um, so it automatically shows that. And then it says, you know what? Well, those are the last trains for today. I still have all this space, so I'll show him tomorrow's trains too. Uh -huh. I saw this. I, I stole this from... Um, uh, fr from my airport when I fly out to Iceland. Um, it's usually the one of the last flights of the night, and they show the flights departing now, and then uh, there's lots of space at the bottom of the monitor, so they say, okay, tomorrow's flights are these. And I stole that idea, and I put it there. And I went to the test users, and they say, oh, bingo, Platsky, you were just way too cool. All right, so, uh, okay, I paraphrase that one just a little, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so you see 
that um, the four steps that we've done today, who, the persona, what, the story, how, the sketch, try it out, iterate, iterate, iterate on actual users, those four things, and look how much better it was than the previous example, than that one where you had to tap four levels deep just to see a schedule with everybody else's on it, and see how much better it is when I iterate it than, than even my own first design. All right? And so, now, and now, my friends, now you take it to Xamarin. Now that you have decided what you were going to build and why you were going to build that, now you take it to Xamarin, and now you build it there. Okay? But deciding what it is that you're going to build, um, I, 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 I think you do it. You need to do it in other places. But once you have it, this is where you take it. Okay. So, and now, my friends, we have a few minutes left for questions and comments. I will also draw your attention to my summer special through the end of August. Uh, three days at your company for the discounted rate of only $99.95. We will work through this exercise on your projects, and I only have two openings available. The time is somewhat flexible, but there are only two of them. So if you want that, you can call me, and that's where you will find me. So thanks ever so much for coming, and uh, let's take your questions. All right. How do you get alerts when your app is in background? We talked about that. It's uh, tricky. Um, it's not easy. And we, we sort of figured it out that we would rather have text alerts sent to the phone. So even if your app is, is not running at all, not in, as opposed to in background, that it would come in on a text alert. So we, we decided that was kind of outside the province of our app. Do you show notifications for alert? It would be a good experience. Same thing. Inbound tab should say arrive. Outbound tab should say departs. After if switch to North Station, yeah, maybe. Uh, great class, thank you. Describe in one sentence telemetry and security. Telemetry is keeping track of what your users do, okay? Um, I show users these tabs um, and, and, and they tell me things, but with telemetry, you look and you say, okay, how often did they, when did they use it in the suburbs, when did they use it in the city, how often did they tap on this tab, and so on. That's what that is. Um, security, well, that's, there's not a lot of security and privacy here. Um, we we'd sort of talk about that with a credit card a little bit. Uh, security, you need to, I'm writing the chapter on that now, you need to think about what, um, how security is going to interact with your user. And, and it's a big, big problem because users are not security conscious animals. They are, you know, when, when you're on your PC in your basement and your wife yells down, hey, Paul Roy, what are you doing? Do you yell back, I'm being secure? You do not. No, you're, um, you're balancing your checkbook or you're, you're answering your emails or whatever else one might be doing. Um, I'll leave that one lying right there. Um, and so you, you, you do not think about security. You don't want to think about security. You don't want your apps to talk to you about security, et cetera. That's what it. Um, how do you vet ideas that are brand new, concepts that don't exist yet? Well, you try them on people. You try them on people. Um, this concept I have not seen before of, um, of adjustments to individual schedules. I've never seen a scheduling app tied to your particular stations. I've only seen them showing your line. And the answer is you show them to users quickly, quickly, quickly. All right. Um, Notifications, alerts, totally, uh, what else? All right. Um, how do you integrate this process in the development process for continuing um, improved development of an app? Well, that's very true. I mean, it's iterative. Everything has to feed back because um, you are going to build, um, you're going to build a prototype. That's you know, a sketch you build into a prototype. A, a sketch is meant to suggest. A prototype is meant to confirm. So you're going to build a prototype. You're going to try that on some more, some more users. You're going to watch them through um, through, tell it through um, a screen program like this, you're going to see what they do, and you're going to have to feed that back into your development environment. You need to make this a um, uh, to make that iteration part of what you do. There's a um, there's um, Let's see. You need to you need to feed this back into your backlog, and and rather than add more features and more features, try to make them. You need to value the seamlessness. You need to value sim value just working, not add obscure things that nobody ever cares about, um, but um, but value making simple things even simpler. All right, so 
Um, need to learn more from you, poor independent developer, spent all my money on Xamarin, hope to learn, read, or get inspired more. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, you know, look, look around. I will, um, sometimes I teach a public class through iDesign um, that people can come to. That's, um, uh, send, send me your contact information if you want. I'll see you get put on the mailing list for that. How do you confirm that your persona is actually representative? How do you iterate on a persona? Well, um, you, what you do is you put it up on the uh, wall of your development space. And of course it's not once and done. Nothing here is once and done. Everything is iterative. And as you learn more things, as you get information from your telemetry, ah, they always tap this, they never tap that. You can put post-it notes there for people to write and post things up on the persona board. Had a persona once that was a military wife and somebody just wrote, ah, sorry, new orders, time to move again. That's how you, that's how you iterate that. And uh, thank you for your You're welcome. After the sketches, do you test the UI done by a designer later? By definition, that doesn't matter anywhere near as much. Right? You see, if, if the font's a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, yeah, it's important, but that can get done later. This, as you see, cannot. This has to get done first. Presentation available for download. Last I heard, um, uh, Xamarin, uh, the guys were going to post that. Why do you want to remember the CVV number? It isn't secure at all. Uh, fire upon you, sir. You are putting security ahead of usability. Um, the user doesn't give a damn about security. All right. Um, if the if you buy, what happens? Suppose it was just tapping a um, tapping a button to buy another ticket. What happens? Um, uh, what happens if his phone gets stolen? Somebody can buy more tickets, but they can only use them on that phone. They can't be transferred to another phone. They have to be activated in order to be used. The activation can notice that they don't need it, and um, they're they're making the user do work that the program ought to be doing. And I'm sorry, but that is wrong. What is the problem? What if it's a requirement from a card vendor? Find another card vendor. That's what. What about an app that answers several pain points for several users? How to merge those two? That's a rather abstract question. I would need a specific example to say um, something else. Can't store, uh, you know, the, the, it's only 10 bucks a trip. And if somebody buys one with a credit card number and it then gets reversed, they have to give back that $10. What have they lost? They had somebody ride their train without paying. That cost them exactly zero. If they sent somebody a personal computer um, that they could then resell, and then they got reversed, they would be out a lot of money. If this thing gets reversed, um, then they have lost exactly zero. And so you are talking about an edge case, and you were trying to get the edge case to dominate the main case, and that is exactly what this design talk is against. Right? You're a geek, you're looking for the edge cases. Stop it, look for the main thing. Um, how do you confirm that your persona is actually representative with data? How do you iterate on a persona? You um, keep getting information on them. You invite more users to your labs. Um, you, well, uh, you, you, you talk to them, they come, they join your users group, you go to places where they are, you invite them in for, uh, you give them free barbecue someday, uh, you know, you work with your users, that's how. Awesome, David, well thank you so much for this great lecture. Okay. My pleasure. I Have think you ever I had users lie? Yeah, all the time. This is, they cancel each other out. Yeah, this is some good stuff. I'm gonna put up uh, one last slide if I can find my name in here there it is <laughs> okay and show my screen perfect so okay. hopefully you can see uh, this thank you slide and uh, we've got another lecture coming up July 15th with David Giard who's going to talk about Azure mobile services combined with Xamarin so make sure you uh, come for that and uh, just thank you again, Dave. This was a great lecture, and we will get this published and put online uh, ASAP okay. for people to go back and Very revisit good. it again. All right. So thanks so much, and uh, thanks for attending Xamarin University, everybody. Thank you all. Give a buzz.